So we spent a lot of time in this course so far um, when we thought about the operational semantics that's associated with linear logic. Um, first on this idea of um, proof reduction as computation. And that was related to um, some kind of session types. Um, and then we had another way of giving operational semantics. It was by some, something called focusing and forward chaining, where the proof search itself was giving you the, the operational semantics. Um, and essentially, the way that forward chaining works is that you, you, have, a, you have a state. I mean, the simplest form is just a, a, a gamma and a delta together and you make a transition to a gamma prime and a delta prime. And the gamma, the, the uh, persistent resources, you know that gamma is a subset of gamma prime. And but delta might change in some other unpredictable ways. OK, so that was a forward chaining operation semantics. And in that kind of operation semantics, we neglected um, the right-hand side. OK, so we were not concerned with what we actually want to prove, but just how the state changes. And there were lots of applications that were thinking of this way. The main one was substructural operation semantics, where we described the behavior of a programming language that we, uh, that we specified with forward chaining rules. Okay. Um, but we came to some limitations in this kind of view. Okay. And the example, um, the, we actually did this for linear and for ordered logic. So the, the example we had there was something like this. We tried to, do, we tried to add addition to our ordered specification. So we have a return of a value. And we have a continuation that wants to uh, take the return value and add it to v1. And then we want to return essentially v1 plus v2. But we can't just write v1 plus v2. These are just terms representing natural numbers. Um, and so we actually had to start some computation to do binary addition. What we really want is addition to be like a subroutine, something we call separately that will just compute the answer and not actually start a whole set of concurrent computations that try to do addition. Um, so besides the fact that it's kind of um, tedious to do that, it's also nice because we want addition to be an atomic action. And often in the kind of process that we actually use, you know, addition is an atomic step as far as you can observe of the computation. So what we'd like to do is we like to say something like here, um, plus of v1 and v2 gives us w, and then we want to return w. Okay. So the way we did this before, these things were positive. And the fact that they were positive is the thing that gave rise to the forward chaining semantics. Because when you focus on them, they turn into state transition rules. Okay? Um, and this plus here is actually not supposed to work exactly the same way. Um, what this plus is supposed to do is not actually, you're not looking at the context for a plus v1, v2, w. Because there are infinitely many potentially relevant additions. So you don't expect them to be in the context the way you would expect a return or a cont to be in the context, because you put them there early in the program. But this plus, you don't actually put in the program. It's not there. You have to compute it now. Okay. And the way we're going to achieve that is we're going to have a predicate like this, but we're going to make this negative. Okay. And that's interestingly, that's the only change we need to make in order to make this whole thing work. Okay. So we can have forward chaining state transitions with the positive atoms. And with the negative atoms, we can do a side computation, which gives us a result which you can use inside the forward chaining. Okay, so that's the program that we're going to try to um, carry out. Okay. So let's think about how we would actually uh, specify plus. Okay. And um, last time we did it with forward chaining rules, which is not what you really want. So now we want to do it directly by inference rules. Okay. And then see if we can if we can give it appropriate negative interpretation if things are going to work out. Okay. So um, how would we do that? Okay. So we would write plus. Actually, remember binary numbers n. Um, they were either epsilon or it was n followed by 0 is the last digit of n followed by 1. This was basically 2n. This is 2n plus 1. And this represents the number 0. Okay. So what are some of the rules that we might want to write down for binary addition? Um, 
as a three argument thing um, rather than trying to do forward chaining. Any candidates? N epsilon gives us N. Okay. What else might we have? Okay. More cases? Let's do a case where you have a premise. Let's say N zero. Uh, m zero. What do we return? Hmm? K zero. And how do we get K intuitively? Plus n m is this K? Right. So now I don't have to rewrite this rule, but there's a couple different versions. If this is n one, and this is m zero, what do we return? K1. And this up here stays the same, the premise, right? Because we're adding the rest of the numbers, and the lowest digit is determined. If we have n0 and m1, we also return k1. Okay. Um, so what else do we need? The tricky case. The tricky case. So let's write that out separately. So we have plus of n1, m1. Okay, so how do we do that? That's different ways to do it. So one way to do it, we, we add n plus m, and then we increment the result and return that. Right. So um, we do plus of n, and m gives us l, and then we increment l to get us k, and what do we return? K0. K0, because two two zeros together, two ones together give us zero plus one carry. So we have to add those two things and then add in the carry. Okay. All right, so these are the rules and we have to define increment, but that should be easy. Um, let's do increment epsilon. What does increment epsilon give us? Epsilon one, epsilon one the number one, right? If you have increment N0, what is the result of that? N1. OK. And I guess one more case. If I increment N1, what do I get? Hmm? Yeah, we need to increment N. And that gives us K. And what do we return here? K0. OK. All right. So now we have specified addition, okay? And now the hope is that if we make if we make plus negative, we can use it in this place. Everything will work out correctly from then on, okay? Um, but of course, these are inference rules, and we're actually at some point make this connection between inference rules and writing things in this kind of uh, axiomatic style where they're universally quantified, which we put into the unrestricted context in order to focus on. So we have to take these rules and we have to translate them into the corresponding rules, okay, in our, um, and add them to this unrestricted context gamma, which represents the program. So let's take this first rule here. How would we express this as a rule um, inside as an unrestricted or persistent assumption? So what does the line correspond to? Yeah, it's an implication. Now, we're in this case, if we want to be strict, it would be an ordered implication. Let's revert back to linear logic, because it has nothing to do with order, just to keep it simple. So we would say we have plus of n m k implies plus of n 0 m 0 k 0. And that would be quantified here for every n, for every m, and for every k. 
Okay, so that would be take that rule and write it down as a logical axiom. Okay. So now the question is if you focus on that, what actually what happens, right? So now we go back to our old the old idea that this this thing here is part of our program. So that's in the context gamma that represents our program. Okay, so we have gamma sub p. Um, and we have some context delta. And let's say we focus on this particular assumption. Um, so we'd be focused on um, for all n, for all m, for all k, and then plus of some stuff, arrow plus of some other stuff. And on the right-hand side, we're trying to prove c. Okay. And now the twist is to what we had before, that these things are negative in this case. Okay. So if you want to see the effect of focusing on this, um, we'll, we'll get to this particular sequence, right? Okay. So what happens when we're focused on something like this? Now we have to remember the rules for focusing with quantifiers. Anyone remember how that works? Right, so really we have some kind of a context psi here. And so what we need is we need some term n. And I guess in this case it would have type nat for natural number. And then we would still be in psi and gamma sub p. And we would be in delta. And now we would be focused on for all m, for all k, then p minus of something, or p minus of something else, and we're still trying to prove c. And in here, we have substituted this n that we're looking for here for the bound variable n which we had here. Okay. So we can do that two more times. So we have m is a natural number, and k is a natural number. And once we do that, these things stay unchanged. So then we have a context delta, and we're focused on plus of uh, n m k linearly implies plus of uh, n zero m zero k zero. And we're still trying to prove c on the right hand side. Okay, so that's the situation we get to. Okay. So now at this point, um, so what happens at this point? We have to prove this in focus, and so we get two premises. So in the first premise, we have to prove plus, which is actually negative. And mk. And over here, we put this new assumption plus, which is negative of n0, m0, k0, and we're still trying to prove c. Okay, and we have to split the context delta somehow between these two premises, right? Um, we'll have to wait. Let's just wait and see what happens here. Uh, so, what happens over here? When you're focused on a negative atom, we lose focus. If it was a positive atom, what would happen? Reminder? It has to be in the context. But here it's a negative atom, so we just lose focus. So here we just go back to proving plus of n, m, and k. Um, what happens over here? Right. If you focus on a negative atom, right, the restriction says that it must be equal to the right-hand side, which is symmetric to the situation with the positive atom. And you're focused on the right, it must be the thing on the left. If you focus on a negative atom on the left, it must be the thing on the right. Otherwise, it fails. So here we know that C has to be equal to plus n0, m0, k0. And what else do we know? Yeah, because this is an initial sequence. Once c is equal to that, 
Um, there cannot be anything else here, okay, in the linear context. So the whole linear context actually must go to here. Okay. Okay. So now we have a, um, a derived rule of inference that we should write down somewhere. Let's write it down over here. What that looks like. So if we're in delta. Um, and we have a psi, and we have a gamma sub p, and a delta. And uh, we're trying to prove what, what does c look like? c is plus uh, n mk. Did I copy that correctly? n0. I didn't copy it correctly. OK, n0, m0, k0. Um, this branch over here. That's finished. There's no subproof left. So the only thing that's left is this thing over here. So the derived rule that corresponds to focusing on that will be this. Like that, right? So just following your nose and seeing what comes out. OK. So wait, but that's more or less, it's almost exactly the rule that we started with, right? We took this rule here. Okay, and we turned it into a, a, a linear proposition, which is part of our gamma. But then focusing on it when p is negative gives you essentially back the original rule, except now we make the context explicit in this kind of a rule. Okay, and so this is exactly the opposite of what happens in forward chaining. Okay, in forward chaining the action I just erased it. The action is entirely on the left hand side. The delta is transformed to delta prime. The gamma is, reformed, is transformed to gamma prime. Okay. Here, nothing happens in the context. Okay. But we just work on the right-hand side. We reduce the goal of proving that to the goal of proving that. Okay. And so this step here, that's the, what's the, uh, the backward chaining. Um, and it's often. that it's goal-directed search. Because unlike the state transformations, where you don't even look at the right-hand side, all that really matters here is the right-hand side. Okay. And if these are resources that you have, and this is a goal you're trying to achieve, this is goal-directed search. We work from the goal, and reduce the goal of proving that to the goal of proving that. Okay. All right, so, um, so if you try to compare the two, um, in the forward chaining way, you have a way to describe general computation, changes of state of complex systems, okay, like puzzles or programming languages and so on. In the backward chaining way, you have, um, you have a way to compute particular predicates in the goal-directed way, okay, rather than just state transformations. Okay, so now we'll have to see what it's actually, what we need in order to make this kind of thing work. And so there's a couple of things we ought to do. One is to figure out which fragment of the language does it work for. So with forward chaining, we spend a little bit of time trying to figure out for which fragment of the language does focusing on the particular propositions correspond to a straight transformation. And now we have to ask a similar question. If you focus on some formulas, under which kind of circumstance it does correspond to a, a goal transformation or this kind of goal-directed search kind of step, yeah? Okay, so there are three premises, which are these three, that we should prove. Okay, um, but what we generally do is we assume that when we have a goal, that the goal is already well typed when we start, and for this goal to be well typed, n zero would have to be of type nat, and this would be of type nat, and this would have to be of type nat. Um, so it turns out, in many cases, if we do this correctly, the fact that n is a natural number, where n is a natural number is already implied okay, by the goal that we're trying to solve. Okay. So, um, so what happens is that those kind of premises don't really come into play usually operationally in a very strong way. Okay. But it's a good question, so we need to be careful about these things. Um, but usually they turn out to be redundant. Other questions? Okay. So, 
Ja. Ja. No, cut doesn't work with either one of them. So, um, because the whole, this whole idea is based on the focusing system, and the focus system cut is not an inference rule, it's just admissible, which we proved in order to show that it's complete, but it's not really part of the inference system, so there's no cut in here. So cut is really important when we actually interpret proof reduction as computation, but we want to eliminate cut if proof search becomes our mode of computation. Yeah, I think cut is generally intractable in this kind of yeah. backward chaining. I tried at some point, like in the early 90s, I tried to make some sense of it. And, um, but uh, I think it was a limited success. <laughs> the reason is because when you do, uh, maybe this is getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but um, you can use kind of backward chaining, for example, to describe type inference in a very simple way, in a very high level way. But it doesn't work very well with lets, because when you do type checking for a let, you kind of have to generalize the type. You have to put in universal quantifiers because you can use the thing that you, that you analyze at multiple different types. And that's not a backward chaining step. You have to, f you have to add the quantifiers on. So, um, so uh, it works only to a certain extent at some point. Um, so I was trying to, we were trying to think if we could explain that particular with a kind of a cut. Um, but like I said, I was never really quite satisfied with, with the results. Okay. So there's a few things I swept under the rug as usual. Okay. So uh, one of the things I swept under the rug is that in our example of the, the operational semantics, what we had is the, the first argument and the second argument, the V1 and V2, and we wanted to compute and return the result. So we didn't have the third argument, right? So we have to slightly generalize the way we think about inference. We have to take into account that the unknowns that we're determining as part of the search process. Okay. So, so far, kind of the only unknown that we ever had was the proof. We were asking, is there a proof? Can we construct a proof? But now we also ask, are there terms that make this true? Okay. So let's go through an example of that. Okay, I'll erase it over here. <clears throat> okay, so let's say um, a simple example would be um, we have in our program, okay, we're supposed to add two numbers and we computed the first one to, let's say, uh, epsilon one zero and the second one to epsilon zero one. And of course, we don't know the answer yet. Okay, so let's say the answer is some kind of a k. And here, k is what's called a logic variable, or sometimes it's called an, an existential variable. Because what we're asking in particular in plus, we don't actually need any context here that's linear. We're just trying to find something that makes this provable. And we know the first two things, but we don't know the third one. Okay. So how do we proceed? Well, we have to look at our rules there, which are actually, you know, sort of, we have to add deltas everywhere to be precise with respect to what I just said. But we can just look at the rules this way because we know the two things are really equivalent. Okay. So which rule could have been applied for this one? Um, this rule doesn't work because this has one and one and this has zero and one. Um, the other plus rules, the only plus rule that works would be this one, right? The third one. This one, we have plus here, okay? Okay, so if that's the conclusion, what would be the premise? Plus of epsilon one, epsilon zero, Okay, so now, okay, so here we find that k equals 
k prime 1, right? Because if this thing matches the conclusion here, then this k, which was a variable, must actually be k of some 1. And in the premise, we have the k, which are called k prime. OK, so if there is a proof at all, it must look like this. OK, um, okay now how can we prove this? It's the second rule here, second version of this rule. Um, and what, what did we find out about k prime? It's k double prime followed by 1, right? And so then we have to solve plus epsilon, and epsilon gives us k double prime, right? OK, how do we solve that? Well, it looks like there's two rules that could apply, right? But they give us the same answer, hopefully. And what's the answer here? k double prime is epsilon, right? The empty bit string, which represents 0. So at this point, we actually have a complete proof. And we also have a substitution for the variables okay, that we had in the original. So what do we find out that k is? So k is k prime of 1, k prime is that. So we get epsilon 1, 1. Okay? Uh, yeah, 2 plus 1 make equals 3. So we actually did this correctly. Okay? All right. So in order to actually use backward chain in an interesting way, uh, we need to be able to deal with goals that have these kind of uh, free variables, logic variables, existential variables, sometimes called meta variables in them. Okay? And we need to instantiate them as part of the proof search procedure. Okay? Now the question is, does that always work? So if you put a plus goal here, okay, and we run it through, will we always get an answer out? So what do we need to do in order to, in order to show that that's the case or find a counterexample to it? Well, we have to analyze the rules that we have, right? So, so we assume we're given the first and the second argument because that's a way when we actually call it, that's what we know. We know what's the first and the second argument. We're trying to compute the third one. Now that's called a mode, okay? So this is an input, this is an input, and this is an output of this predicate, okay? Um, so unfortunately, and I'm sorry about this, the way that this is usually written is that this is, an input is written as plus, okay? And the output is written as minus. And that's different from the plus and minus that we use for atoms being positive or negative, okay? But it's the same symbol, okay? All right, so now what we need to do is we need to take this program and we need to, um, what we call mode checking, okay? We need to mode check in order to make sure that um, it respects this mode if we give it input here, which, is, which are ground terms, that the third argument will always be ground if we succeed in finding a proof. Of course, we may not necessarily succeed in finding a proof, okay? So we'll come to that in a second. Um, but let's first check each of the rules, okay? So here, if we know the first and the second argument, will, we, will the third one be ground if this rule applies? Why is that? Because we know that's ground, and that's what we need to check here. How about this rule? You know the first two are ground. We know the third one will be ground. OK. Um, OK, now in all of these rules, OK, so let's say we know this first and the second argument. OK, so we know that n, we know what n and m are. OK, now that allows us to call it in this way because we know what n and m are. So that's the good news. So we find out that if you're calling it this way, where the first and second argument is known, then n and m will be known. OK, so then sort of inductively, if, the, if you succeed to prove that you know what k is, and so you can construct k applied to 1, OK, k followed by 1, and this will be known because k is known by assumption here, and therefore it'll be no, the k applied to 1 will be known over here. Um, so that looks all pretty good. Um, so let's look at this one here. We know n and m, OK. OK. Now how do we proceed now? So we have to show, so we know n and m are known, but k is still unknown. So n and m are known. 
So if we solve this one first, then L will be known when we're done. Okay? If we solve this one first, we'll know L. Um, and now we have to call so that we have to search for a proof of increment L and some unknown in the second argument. If that succeeds, hopefully we'll know what K is, and then we know what K is here. So we also have to, in order to be able to show this for plus, we also need to know that increment um, takes an input in the first argument and gives us something ground in the second argument. So we need to check that over here. So we know the first argument, we know the second. If we know the first argument, we know the second. If we know the first argument, then we know what n is, so we can search for proof of that. That'll give us a k, which we just add something on. Okay. So yes, increment has this mode and plus has this mode. And so that means that if our proof search procedure is able to prove plus epsilon, uh, these two with some k, then we're guaranteed that uh, at the end we know what k is. And that's important because we wanted to compute the sum and put, return the sum to our caller. Okay. Um, so that actually brings up a question. Um, if we had our original um, clause, that unfortunately I, I erased, but let's say we return V1 and we had a continuation that wants, to, or V2 wants to add V1. And let's just say that um, we forgot to call the sum and we would just return W, okay, something like this. Or maybe we call, we call the plus incorrectly. Um, we call it with V1, V2, V1. Okay, something like this. Okay, what actually happens when you try to run this as a forward chaining program? Uh, fortunately, that's not what I asked, Rob, so you're in, you're in the clear. <laughs> okay, so this is problematic because what, what this basically says, is like if you ignore this premise here, if we're returning a value to this continuation, then we return an arbitrary value, okay? So what would our forward chaining program have to do in this case? So it could guess some value, okay? Um, that's probably the best interpretation I can put on it right now would be to say, you can, you're allowed to return anything, whatever you want, okay? But we wouldn't really have any reasonable value to actually return here, okay? So in some sense, this should be ruled out, okay? Should have already been ruled out as being something that's incorrect because the things we want in the context are always ground things. They're always terms that have no free variables in them, things that are always known, okay? Um, so how will we check the correct clause where we actually have put the W here? Okay, how would we do that? Okay, so return and cont are positive. This is positive, this is negative. Okay, so this is a forward chaining clause. Okay, so the way we do it as follows. When we try to fire this clause in the forward chaining direction, because this is positive, we look for a return in the context. Everything in the context is always known, and therefore we know what B2 is. Then we look for a continuation in the context which matches this shape. So um, we'll know what V1 is after matching that because anything in the context is always known. Then we solve this as a sub-goal, which may involve some proof search. Um, and it's okay to call it this way because by this time we know what V1 is and we know what V2 is, assuming that we match these things in order. Okay. So we have to be careful when we do this that we actually match these things in order because if we try to do this first, we don't know yet what V1 and V2 is and we would not actually be able to find a proof. Okay. Um, okay, and then because it has a negative, uh, it has an output argument in the third position, um, when this plus succeeds to find the proof, then we get a W back, okay, and then we return something here, and this is okay because this is added to the context, but we know W, and so we don't violate our invariant that everything in the context is known, okay. So what we already had, what we already should have done, but we didn't because we it was one of the things that was convenient to sweep under the rug, okay? To check when we have these forward chaining rules um, that they're mode correct in the sense that any variable that um, appears in the head of a rule, okay, must be ground by the time that we get there, must be known by the time that we get there, okay? 
Uh, okay, and for the backward chaining programs, it's equally important. Okay, yep. Correct. So there's implicit quantifiers that say for all v1, for all v2, for all w, and then this implication. Okay, well, we do the same trick. We locally decide we don't know what V1 is, we don't know what V2 is, we don't know what W is. And then we try to imagine the context for something that returns um, and next to it a continuation. And when we find that in the context, then at that point we'll know what V2 is and we'll know what V1 is. Hmm? That's right. So if you have a parallel um, pair, say, where we evaluate the two components of the pair in parallel, there could be a couple of places where you want to do an addition, and any of them that matches is allowed to fire, because in the forward chaining we have don't care non-determinism, so anything that matches can fire. Okay. Right. So, but it is the fact that we look for these things in the context here that will tell us what these variables are. Okay. Um, okay. So, but we have to be careful, and this is a restriction on the operation semantics. We have to match these things somehow in a particular order for this to make sense. Um, now, so here, when we have one of these rules, we have a similar obligation, okay? Um, when, we, when we're trying to find a proof of that, we actually have to be careful to add n and m first and then increment the result. If we try to increment something, um, we can't do that yet because we don't know L, okay? So another way of thinking about it is that in the proof search process, when you search upwards for a proof, in backward chaining, and you have more than one sub-goal, you have to decide in which order to solve the sub-goals in. Okay. And there's a couple of answers to a way to do that. One is um, to try to schedule these dynamically. Okay. So you might schedule and say, I'm here, I know N and M, I don't know L, so this can't fire yet, so I'll execute this. And eventually that'll tell me what L is, and then I can fire, actually search for the proof of this. Or you can schedule, schedule it statically and say, this is the first premise up here, so we'll always search for this first and then for the second. Okay. And from a programmer's point of view, it's easier and more predictable if we just say we always serve, uh, uh, solve things from the left to right. You know, first premise, second premise, third premise, and so on. So this program would be incorrect if you put increment as a first sub-goal over here, the, left, the leftmost premise. Okay. Because you can't actually execute that with this particular mode. Um, sometimes modes are not unique. Um, so you can actually take the same predicate and assign it more than one mode. Okay. So you can run it in different directions. So for example, let's look at increment. Um, can we say increment minus plus? So that's actually using it as a decrement, right? We're giving the second argument, which is supposed to be the result of incrementing. And we want to determine okay, the predecessor. Uh, so can we do that? Okay, so actually there's three rules to check. If we know this, well, there's no variable here that's determined. If we know this, then it's okay to call increment here. We get out the n, and then um, we just add one, so this is known. If you know this, then we can compute that. Okay, so we can use the increment predicate as a decrement. Okay. Now, in the early days of logic programming, okay, this was like a big deal. Okay, so a lot of people they say, okay, I just write down what I mean, increment, and then you can operationalize it in lots of different ways. Um, but I think that uh, the story is that this is a nice story, but it doesn't really work very well for software engineering purposes. In some sense, you know, in some predicates, it happens to work, in others it doesn't. And, um, when you actually want to use a logic program for doing any computation, you need to be aware exactly which modes it works in and which one it doesn't. Okay. So it doesn't really save you much in terms of, you know, generally speaking. Um, so let's see, could we run plus in a different direction? What if the second argument zero? If the second argument... 
Okay, so then it would fail, right, because it doesn't have a predecessor. Right? Okay, so that's an important point. So when we, when we give it this mode, what we're saying is that if you call increment with, with in the t place where the second argument is known, the first one is unknown, and you, you can find a proof, then the first argument will be known. Okay? It doesn't guarantee that the first argument, that you can always prove it. Okay? So this is a good example, because if the second argument is zero, then immediately we know this rule doesn't apply, this one doesn't apply, this one doesn't apply, so we fail immediately. And that's okay, because we can't decrement zero under this definition. Okay. Um, okay, can we use plus in order to subtract? Okay. So we would have to go through and do some kind of mode analysis. Plus, um, let's say the first one is known. Or, okay, we could try this, right? We know the first and the last, and we try to determine the one in the middle. That would be subtraction, right? Okay, so let's see. That's this one. So if you know this one and this one, then we know these two inductively, we'll know that, and we can return that. So this, all these three clauses work. How about these ones here? Um, if you know the first and the last, then this one, first and the last, this one works. Okay. What about this one here? So we know the f this one and this one. Hmm? Okay, now in OK, I can decrement. That gives me the L, and then I can call, call it here. So in order to run it like this, I'd have to re reverse the or these, two or these two premises. So I can't run the exact same program. I have to make one small change in order to be able to run it in a different direction for subtraction. OK. Um, OK. Uh, Okay, any more questions on this? Okay, so now I want to write some more interesting uh, backward chaining programs. Okay, so now we do know essentially what it is. And, but the nice thing is, by the way, that we, we already proved the completeness of focusing, or at least we hand wave the completeness of focusing. Okay. Um, and that means that the, we have backward chaining sort of and forward chaining kind of for free. Right. We can do either of them um, because backward chaining is just an implementation essentially of um, clauses where we have negative atoms. Okay. Now we need to actually write down, we probably should write down what kind of language fragment, what kind of propositions are subject to this kind of goal-directed search just so we know exactly what the fragment of the language is that we're working with. So let me try to do that here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what kind of things can be permitted on the right hand side? So, um, so the right hand side here, okay, um, let's see, what should I call that? Um, uh, um, okay. Let me call that RHS. Okay, since I can't think of a better name right now. Okay. So if there's something invertible, okay, that's okay, we can invert because we don't have to make any choice. Okay. So what's permitted there are invertible things. So which things are invertible on the right hand side? Which kind of propositions are invertible on the right hand side? Implication. Implication. Okay, so, and then that double end up as a left, and the thing on the other side should be some kind of left-hand side, right? Okay, we'll have to see what that is. Um, what else is allowed on the right-hand side? Hmm? For all. Yep, so for all x dot r, okay, or, okay, so I'm going to just write r and l. Okay. T 
top, right? Um, and eventually, it has to be negative atoms, right? Because that's what we're all going for. Eventually, it has to come back to this case. Um, now, on the left-hand side, what are we allowed there? OK, so tensor. Yep, OK. Existential plus. OK. Hmm? OK, so now we come to atoms, OK. So basically, the only atoms that we want to allow are kind of negative atoms. Yeah, you have a question? Bang. Hmm? Bang. bang, OK. OK, but bang of something that, that has to be legal as a program, OK, something we can focus on again, OK. So they can't be bang of an arbitrary formula here, right? So what kind of things are we allowed to focus on? So let's, put, let's, let's call these D. OK, so okay, and atoms, um, but let me just uh, make that part of D so I don't have to repeat it over here. OK, so D are the negative things that I can focus on. OK, so what should these things be? Can I economize? Yeah, do you have an? So what's the difference between R and D? OK, should we just use R? OK. Well, if you focus on something positive, you lose focus, right? Oh, sure, but I mean, you might want to get it out of the... Right, but the problem is we want to do goal-directed search. So what we want, if you want to put some, if you focus on something like A tensor B on the left-hand side, while you're trying to prove some kind of a negative atom, OK? The problem is that when you do that, you just, you lose focus and you get A and B separately. And you haven't really taken the right-hand side into account. So we don't want to allow that, OK? Because that's not really backward chaining. That's really what forward chaining does, right? We focus something. When we get something positive, we break it down, OK? Um, so could we just say that D is the same as R? I don't see why not. Does that make sense? OK. OK, so what does it mean? My programs must look like this. OK. So my programs are universally quantified implication, possibly additive conjunctions. So they're essentially negative that I can focus on. OK. Um, but I can't bottom out with something positive, right? It has to be sort of hereditarily negative. Except when I get to the left-hand side of an implication, then I can have something positive, which I can break down asynchronously until I can come to something that I can then, again, focus on. Okay. So we don't need a separate clause here. Okay. So that includes a whole bunch of formulas. It excludes essentially everything that we did for before with forward chaining, yeah? We don't have them, right? They're not allowed in backward chaining. OK, so that's one of the restrictions. Okay. Um, so this is the pure backward chaining fragment, right? OK. Um,
much. Well, if you can add them only on one side, then they can never appear on the other. Yeah. So they wouldn't add anything, right? Because, right. yeah. Yeah. So I think we have to re-examine this question when we want to mix forward and backward chaining, and then it becomes really hairy. <laughs> okay. Um, but for now, at this point, it's actually relatively manageable. Okay. Okay, because once you break down the thing in, on the left-hand side, then you end up with something in delta. And something in delta is something you can focus on. And so that must be one of these negative things. Okay. So the, the, the stable sequence, in this case, the one where you kind of pause and you have to make a decision, will always have an atomic thing on the right-hand side. And the context will consist of uh, R's. Okay. Both gamma and delta would consist of R's. So that's why R wasn't really a good name, because of the things that allowed on the left hand side. Okay. Um, but we started by thinking about what happens on the right. So, so generally speaking, um, I think um, these would be called, like, sometimes these are called D and these are called G. Okay. But we'll call these, we'll think of these as clauses. And this is goals. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So um, the program I want to write um, is actually a little bit reflective in, in terms of what we've been doing so far. So we've actually been writing these kind of words in order to describe state transitions, like the operational semantics of a programming language. But we actually haven't taken the type checking rules for the language and written those down as a program. Okay. And so that's, uh, that's what I want to do now. So I want to think about the linear lambda calculus as an object language. And I'm trying to implement a type checker for it. We already know how to run it. But how do we type check it? Okay. So, okay. So linear lambda calculus, okay. What do we have in the language of terms? Anybody remember? Yes, okay, that's why it's called the lambda calculus. Okay. Okay. Pairs and tensors. Okay, and we need the corresponding elimination forms. What's the elimination forms for the additive? Pi. pi 1 and pi 2. And what's the elimination form for tensor? Uh, let, let x tensor y equals m in n. Okay, let's just uh, finish it out with the unrestricted with the bang. What do we need for bang? Bang of M, and what's the elimination form for that? Let bang U equals, Let bang U equals M in N. Of course, U also needs to be allowed to occur, and X needs to be allowed to occur. Okay, so let's do with, deal with this language. Okay. Um, so this is my object language now, and I want to write down typing rules for it. Um, so I'm going to have two contexts, gamma and delta. Okay. M colon A, right? So that's, um, I guess, what did we write? We wrote it like this, right? I want to take that judgment and I want to implement it as a judgment that I can do that I can do via proof search. Okay. All right. So let's do the first rule for lambdas. Okay, um, so we have to decide a whole bunch of things. So one of the questions we have to decide is what is going to be our input and our output. So how do we want to think about type checking? Uh, 
obviously the term is an input. That, that much is clear. We can't type check a term we don't have. Hmm? And the type's going to be an output. Okay, we want to make the type an output. Could just be a checker. Yeah, well, we want the context to be an input, right? Type checking a term without knowing the context in which we type check it doesn't make much sense. So we want gamma and delta to be inputs. Uh, but then this, are, this rule already has a problem if this is supposed to be output, right? Yeah? Okay, so that's one way to go. Okay, so we can try to figure out. There's two different judgments involved, one's where we check and one where we synthesize, yeah? Or we can put the, uh, the type of the argument here, lambda x colon a, okay? Um, so then we know that, um, and that is, a, so we can make this recursive call because we know what a is. We get b out and then we can construct this as an output, okay? Um, so, Let's see. Okay, let's try to do it this way, where this is known and this is what we're trying to synthesize, and we know that we need to type here. So um, we could do the, the other thing another time. Okay. Okay. Um, so the question is, how do we actually write this down as a rule, sort of in our language? Okay. Um, because that's an inference rule. So it gets a little bit tricky. So we need a predicate like, let's call it. Uh, um, what should we call it? Uh, has type. No, uh, that doesn't work. That, that says hasty. That's not what we want to be. Um, let's say off M A. Okay. So the type of M is A. Let's think of it this way. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's can we can we take this thing and we convert it to a rule for this predicate? How would that work? Yeah, so what happens with gamma delta? That's a good question. Right, so we want to take the gamma and delta, and we want to put these into the context um, that we have by, you know, in our type checker at the meta language. Okay. Um, so what we want to have is something like, let's forget about the gamma right now, of x a, and then we want to have this thing should be and be something we want something like this in the premise right with this assumption we can prove this okay so what does that mean how do we actually write this this backward chaining rule actually let's write down what the conclusion would say would say off lambda x colon a dot m which depends on x has type a arrow b, okay? Um, and this would have to hold in the premise, okay? So one way to say that is that say it like this, okay? So if from the assumption that x has type a, we can prove that m has type b, okay? And this is m for this x. Then we can conclude that lambda x colon a m of x has type a arrow b. Okay. Um, it's not quite 100 percent right yet um, because we need to make sure that this x here, which is added to the context, doesn't already exist. This is always chosen new, so there's no conflict with other variables that we've already called. And we do that by quantifying this implication here. So we say something like for all x, okay. Assuming that x is type A, we prove m of x has type B. Then we allow to conclude that lambda x m of x has type A arrow B, okay. So now we should make sure that this in our language, right? We, off is negative, okay. So if it's not in our language, then now we're in deep trouble, okay. Um, okay. So that should be a clause, right? Because it's part of our program. So then this should be. An R. Is this thing an R? 
because this it should be this case. Yes, because it's a negative atom, so we're okay on that. And this universally quantified implication should be an L. Um, is that allowed? Right, it's an L, but it doesn't decompose, so it goes back to R. So is this thing a valid uh, R? It's universally quantified uh, with an L over here and an R over here, which is a P minus. Okay, so this seems to be in our fragment, so we lucked out. Okay. Um, all right. So that would be the representation of this inference rule as a backward chaining program. So, um, and the way we, we should check the modes on this. Okay, so this is input and this is supposed to be output. So when we start, we don't know this. This is going to be some kind of variable. Okay. Now when we when we analyze this here, we get to know a and we get to know m. Okay. And then we introduce a new x. Um, this assumption, we know A because we know it from here, and we know X because we quantified over here. So that there's going to be a new parameter put into the context. So this one's going to be OK. And about this one here, um, so we know M because we know it from here. Okay. And inductively, it'll tell us what B is, so we can put together this error over here and return that. OK, okay so this we're in good shape for this. Um, so let's try one more for, one for application. Hopefully, it might actually be a little bit easier. Um, so what does application look like? Delta 1, delta 2, m applied to n has type b. If in delta 1, m has type a, error b. And in delta 2, n has type a. OK, so that should be our rule. Um, so how do we translate this? Uh, so let's do mode checking first, okay, on this. If you want to use this in the direction, we know this and we know the context. Okay, so we know M, and so we get A and B out of that if this succeeds. We get an A and B out. Um, and here, we know n, we get an a out. We have to compare these two things, see if they're equal, because we get them out of both sides, right? We have to make sure they're equal. If not, then we'll fail, right? We can't prove it. But if they're equal, then we know b because we know it from here, so we can return it here. Okay, so the modes work out. So we know it's a full context, but yeah. how do we know how to split it? Yeah, that's a very good question. So in fact, nothing in this rule tells us how to split it. So let's write it down, and let's, then let's worry about how to do that. Okay. So how would we write this if you think about it as a program? So what would be the first premise here? Of M, A, O, B. Tensor of M, A. Arrow of m applied to n, b, right? And implicitly quantified over m, n, uh, and a and b, OK? So is that in our fragment? It should be. Um, so that would have to be an r. An r is allowed to be an implication, where the left-hand side is an l. A tensor is allowed here. And then the components, again, are negative atoms. So they get us to the r back to here. And the right-hand side is a negative atom, which is allowed because of this. OK, so it's in our fragment. Um, OK. And I think there's some independence here. I could swap these two premises, and it wouldn't matter, right? Because, because every term synthesizes its type, so the order in which I do these things doesn't matter. Um, OK. OK, so now we come to the question of what actually happens here with the context. Okay. So, so far, when we did forward chaining, we were very cavalier about the context in some sense. When you have a forward chaining rule, what you do is you find a place, you try to, you, you try to find all the premises into, in the context by matching them. If they're in the linear context, you remove them. If they're in the unrestricted context, you leave them there. Okay. And then you add the right-hand side after you have constructed it to the context. Okay. 
So we didn't have to do anything fancy with the context. It was a very straightforward thing. In the ordered context, it was a little bit trickier because we have to look for the left-hand side of the forward chaining rule as a together in the context, right? So we have to kind of scan the context and try to find all those things next to each other, okay? And then right in that place, we have to plug in the right-hand side right in that place in the context, okay? Uh, but still, those things are very straightforward. Here, we have this big problem that in order to use this rule or this rule, we actually don't really know um, how to split the context, okay? So when you try to use this in order to prove that M and S tie B, you're kind of on your own because you don't know how to split the context. Okay, so we need something that's called context management, okay, in order to really get delta one and delta two um, to figure out what they are, okay. Any ideas how we might do that? <clears throat> right. Okay. So the obvious thing to do in some sense in this setting, okay, is that um, we already know in which order we're going to do these two things in. Um, because in order for the modes to make sense, we need to do the premises, the, 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 the sub goals, in a particular order, right? We need to match them. Um, and in this case, it would be this, then this. Even though in this particular program, we could write it the other way around. In general, we have to try to find proofs of sub-goals in a particular order because otherwise the program might be not be well-moded. So we already know that we're going to do this one first and then this one. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the whole context and we'll, we'll, we'll give it to the first sub-goal. Okay. Now when we prove that, that'll consume some of these resources here. And then we take the ones that we haven't consumed and we, we pass it on to the second one and hopefully the second sub-goal will, will consume the rest. Okay, so what we have to do is, we, in order to describe that search behavior, we have to generalize our judgment or change our judgment to actually pass through contexts. Okay, so um, by the way, now from this point on, uh, I trust that you would be able to complete the specification. Okay, for the type checker, yeah. The annoying T, this one. It hasn't become annoying yet because I haven't shown you the rules. But if you already know, then you know that it's annoying. But yes, so, um, OK, so, OK, I'll show you what happens. And then you see that the T is indeed annoying, OK? Um, and then there's a couple of different answers one can take on that. And um, CLF, which is one of the main tools that we actually implements all of this here, forward and backward chaining, uh, doesn't have the top in it. And hopefully after, maybe not at the end of the lecture, but after next lecture, you'll actually know why. Okay. And also how we get around not having, having it in the language. Okay. So in order to describe backward chaining, um, in order to describe the resource management of backward chaining, okay, our main judgment is going to be something like this. So we have a delta input and we return a delta output. And we have a gamma. Um, but the gamma is actually not a problem because the gamma is just propagated anywhere and then nothing is ever consumed from it. So it's not going to create any issue. And with all of this, we're going to try to prove an R if I get it. If I get it correct, okay. Okay, so that's going to be our judgment, okay. And now we have to worry about how to actually do that. Um, so we can ask the question in general for linear logic before we even put pluses and minus on it. We can just see if we can rewrite the inference rules, okay, so that we can prove an A over here. Okay, so. Um, so in the tricky case here, when we have two premises and we have to spread the assumptions out, that's actually a tensor. Okay. So a tensor is a good one to look at to start. Okay. So if I have a gamma and I have a delta input, and I, of course I don't know the delta output yet, and I'm trying to prove A tensor B. Okay. 
How would I do that? So previously, I was just magically guessing some kind of a split in the inference rule, right? Yeah? There are two premises, excellent. So always start with the things that we know. OK. OK, so we take all the input that we know and we give it all to the left hand side. OK. OK, let's call it delta m for in the middle, the delta middle. OK. Okay. Okay, so the idea is very simple. We take all the inputs that we're allowed to use. We don't know this yet. Okay. We pass them to the left. We get something back here. And then we take whatever we get back and pass it into the proof of B. We get some output here and we return that output over here. Okay. Um, now we should think about the modes, right? Now that we're sensitized to this idea of modes. When we prove this, we know gamma, we know delta input, and we know A. Um, but we don't know the output, right? Um, so we always need to be conscious that whether the rules that we write are mode correct in this sense, okay? Um, okay, so what happens with one? If we try to prove one, uh, if we have gamma, delta input, and we want to prove one. It gives you the same delta back because it can't use anything from it, right? Okay, so let's think about that. If we had something like this and we could complete it, what would be the theorem that would be relating it to the old definition of provability? Okay, so if gamma delta i slash delta o proves a. Yeah? You take gamma, you take delta input, and you subtract out the things that are left. And those are the things that are used in the proof of a. Right? Is that what you meant? Yeah. OK, let's check if that works. OK, you have doubts? Um, Okay. Um, what happens like with the top problem? Like you should be able to prove A volley top tensor A and A volley top tensor top. Okay. Um, My example is not perfect, but it seems like you don't know what delta to get out and pass to the second. Okay. All right. Okay. So I guess. Um, well, let's do this thing first, and then let's come to the top problem. So what happens here is that, is, does it make sense what I wrote down there? Yeah? Yeah, like a multi -set minus. Yeah, multi -set minus. So if you have multiple occurrences of the same. So basically, these two are kind of in parallel, where you remove things kind of in specified position. And um, the delta output can have the same exact shape, and you can subtract it off. So we should um, look at the atoms, and then we look at top. Let's look at the atoms first. So if we have, um, and we're trying to prove an atom. OK, we're only interested in case of negative atoms, but actually probably doesn't matter right here. OK. So what actually, how does this work now? Yeah? Um, the default will be some fields are plus the atom, and also will be the fields. Okay. So we find P somewhere, and then we output the rest, right? Because we don't use any of the rest. You know, that would be guided by this theorem, right? That if you want to show this, then we should subtract delta from here, and we get out the thing that actually proves P. Okay, makes sense. So we just have to be make sure that if there's multiple occurrences of the same thing, 
that only one of them is subtracted out appropriately. Okay, so that should be some kind of multi-set difference that we're taking there. Okay. Another way we could do it is that we could find P in the context and just replace it by some kind of an underscore saying it's been used, it's no longer there. And we can kind of track these things as we're going through. Okay. All right. So that seems easy. So the problem, the question is, if we try to prove top. So let's remind ourselves the rule for top is this. Okay. We can prove top from any set of linear assumptions. So now, okay, how do we complete that rule? So in the first paper on resource management, um, what Hodas and Miller did was essentially this. Okay. Non-deterministically, you're allowed to return any subset of the input. Okay. So intuitively, the, the role that over here, the delta that you consume is actually the difference between the two, and you return anything else, right? And so the problem with this rule is that, you know, if you want it to be mode correct, so this is known, this is known, this is known, and you're supposed to generate this, okay, then you actually have to enumerate all the possible subsets here. You have to make a guess of what subset. And that's exactly what we wanted to avoid with the system, right? We didn't want to make a guess. Because if we wanted to guess, we could have guessed the split in the first place, right? We wanted to make it deterministic, so we wouldn't have to make those kind of guesses, okay? Um, all right, so we have to do something else, okay? There's a couple of different ways to do it, okay? So one way to do it is to say that um, any assumption delta input uh, at this point may or may not have been consumed, and you, you have a kind of a flag that indicates whether the assumptions that are left are strict or could have been consumed earlier, okay? So if you do that, what you would do is we return all of the inputs, but we mark them as being lax, Okay, saying that you're not required to consume them um, because they could have been consumed anywhere else. Okay. And then in the second version, we actually had three contexts. We had a gamma, which is the persistent one, which is easy. We had a psi, and we had a delta input slash delta output. Okay. And the psi here is maybe consumed. Um, you mean introduce the more complicated formula. Unfortunately, A with 1 is not very compatible with focusing, so it doesn't really work in the logic programming context. So that's the problem. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so we actually introduce more machinery in order to handle that. Okay. Um, but there is a more significant problem, actually, with having top in the language. Um, which is that in general, when you do backward chaining, you want to be precise about the resources that you actually use. Okay. Um, and uh, you also want some kind of modularity in two programs. If you have, if you have two programs, okay, one is doing the typing relation. And you have another program that maybe um, uh, computes, um, maybe evaluates these things with some destination D and so on. And you put these things together, you want to be able, to, each program to still work. So in a functional programming language, this is kind of obvious, because if you have a function, you see all the functions that it calls, and there's going to be no interference. Okay. Um, but in this kind of logic programming language, you really have to worry about the fact whether programs that are defined on different predicates, whether they could interfere with each other. Okay. And the problem with top is that top does absolutely not care what is contained in these deltas. 
So the things that are contained here could actually come from a different part of the program that you never intended, which you really wanted to be linear. Okay. So the problem with top is not so much the resource management because we've found techniques to handle that. The problem with top is that your specifications are no longer modular because top in one part of the program could consume assumptions which have come from a completely different part of the program. And this lack of modularity um, is, is a big issue because you always want to reason about a program by reasoning about its pieces and then making a conclusion about the whole program. If you have top in the language, that turns out to be very difficult. Okay. So um, therefore, when we use this for forward and backward shading, we actually don't have top in the language. We just throw it out. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll probably come back to that um, when we come to CLF. And we're starting to work our way up. Because CLF is concurrent logic of framework. So what does it have? It has forward chaining and backward chaining. And it has a way of combining the two. Um, and uh, um, it, uh, it doesn't have top. Um, but in order to, to get around the fact that it doesn't have top, it has affine assumptions as a primitive. So we know in linear logic we can encode affine assumptions by using A with 1. You know, affine A is defined as A with 1, which you know since the midterm, OK? Um, but the problem is that A with 1 behaves very differently under focusing than you would like an affine assumption to behave. And therefore, we can't really use that definition in the logical framework, OK? So we have to introduce affine assumption as a primitive. OK, so I'm already over time. So I'm trying to get out the next assignment today, OK? And for this assignment, you can pair up, OK? And in fact, there's going to be uh, a different questions, which are somewhat open-ended, and you pick one of them, okay, and work it out. Okay, so you can pick, you know, um, and I just haven't formulated all the questions out, even though I know basically what I what I want to ask. Okay, and um, it should be due about in a in about two weeks or so. I'll put the due date on it when I when I get it out. So these are going to be more open-ended things, rather than very fixed questions. Um, but they're going to be a little bit more, um, they're a little more extensive, not just like some, some small thing that is going to be a little bit bigger. So it um, some of them might involve coding if you want, others don't. So it's a kind of a choice that you can make. Okay, I still have some of the midterms for people who haven't picked them up. They can stop by my office if they want them. Okay. So I'll see you on Wednesday.